Okay. So the goal of using OMI as, as making a contrast to human fraud is that OMI, other than emphasizing human, emphasizes the phenotypes. What <coughs> happens when a protein is not working right or when there's mutations and how they behave. It also emphasizes something very different from Uniprot in the sense that if you have enough annotations, Uniprot is gonna tell you this protein is nuclear, mitochondrial, extracellular, whereas they here in Nomi, they are gonna emphasize the location of the genes. Where in the genomes, where in the chromosomes, uh, and not, not at all, where in the cell and they're gonna be located. In some instances, because of the phenotype, they also emphasize the developmental aspects of that gene. This hemoglobin, uh, which is, I don't know exactly what it, what it is, it's considered, the phenotype is considered important to the fetal uh, stage of humans. Uh, just the same as Uniprot, the other one was good enough, just the same as Uniprot, we have a code that specifies either a, a gene or a phenotype and another extra set of codes that define if this phenotype has a known molecular basis or if it's just a phenotype or if it's just a gene. In a way, it's telling us how much information is there available for that specific entry. Um, I didn't show you this one last class, but this is where I was heading. What, these are the statistics for the OMIM. But what it includes is that very same code, the asterisk for gene description, the plus for gene and phenotype, the hashtag for phenotype description and molecular basis, and the percentage for phenotype description or locus and molecular basis unknown. Of course, there's another case, uh, let's call it unlabeled, where there's mainly phenotypes with suspected Mendelian Basis. That is, there's all the variety of information. This one is not characterized as reviewed or annotated or evidence at the transcript level, but in these categories. They are, they are about the same in a way that probably this, the hashtag, will be the most interesting. If we know the molecular basis, we can probably diagnose that phenotype or understand that phenotype better. I think that these statistics, yeah, this is our last year. So the totals will be the sum of all of these columns. And here we have something that we saw in the entry for hemoglobin, that there's going to be autosomal phenotypes, X-link, Y-link, mitochondrial, and the total for each category. So you should know and, or remember, I don't know if you covered that in the university, that X-link pretty much implied that females are going to have it. They can be carriers or manifest the phenotype. And why means that males are going to gonna be the carriers. Of course, I'm excluding any chromosomal, chromosomal aberration that can happen. Is that part clear? Yes. You sure? Maybe we're going to see a, a case, maybe not. Sometimes we can find that X-link can be, according to this database at least, characterized as dominant or recessive. And the reason is that females have two X chromosomes and sometimes expression is weird and even so this is not the class for that but even in different cells in your bodies for the cases of the females you can have different expressions of different X chromosomes so it, that may seem complicated I don't think that happens for Y link because unless you have a chromosomal aberration you only have one Y but uh, I'm not excluding that mitochondrial of course means the genes are in the mitochondria and those so, would you consider those Mendeliantly inherited? How does mitochondrial inheritance happen in humans, at least? In a way, it's an X link. It's not linked to the X, but only the females can inherit, as far as we know, inherit mitochondria. But here it's segregated because some of these. Now that we know a lot about the human genome, we probably know that those specific genes are in the mitochondria, so they are in a category of their own, because they are not located in any chromosome. So everybody has that clear? Yes. Okay. Because in a way, that is going to be similar for many hominids, many animals, but 
by no means make that a blanket statement for every living thing. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are weird things to inherit. Just comparing this database only with Uniprod, we have a type of validation, but not so much a validation as to how much information there's no, it's known about this. Phenotypes, molecular bases, the curation, that is totally different, that in fact we don't get a specific score, that's the way it goes. But do we, do get, we do get a nice versioning and history for the database, and this is, as to last year, the history of updates. Uh, this history is, um, I probably you don't use this anymore. Have you used a mailing list? No? Yeah, it's too old for you. But this, this used to be the way mailing lists were handled. This was supposed to be the traffic. So this, this would be like per month, how many posts happening that month, new and changes over previous ones. This historical database allows you to know which things were added to the database and which have been changed. So there's history. It's totally different from the one in Uniprod, and it's kind of easy to see why. Even if we add all of these numbers, the number of phenotypes and genes listed in OMI, it's tiny in comparison to the half a million that we can find in Uniprod. So this is handled totally different. But we can find the history of those entries, and uh, I don't know why I didn't show more. Let me go to the actual site. Oh, sorry, not online. There we go. Statistics, here is the update list as of this year. If you look back at my slide, that one, that one ended here. So we can also gather that this database is updated monthly. Last month, or rather this month, these are the updates that have changed. If we click over here, we should get a little bit of more detail about that. There's amyloidosis update a new entry about CDK5, and many, many other things. Look, look at the history. The entries are separated as updated, updated clinical synopsis, and that's about it for this month. There could be more things in others. Moved entries, this one changed code. We don't know the reason, but if you were looking for this one and you don't find it anymore, now it's over here. Because it's losing the symbol, it might be that the description, the information have been revised and it's no longer something that we don't know what's the molecular basis. But as I said, this, is, this history is very important because let's say you started the quarter doing research on this and suddenly you, don't know, you no longer find it. You don't want to end up behind it, right? You, if you find it in the history, now you move over here and continue doing what you were doing, or maybe even discarding that piece of information. These are the updated entry statistics, which probably haven't changed that much. Or would you like to compare them? Just to see. They, what will, where where you, would you expect more information to be uncovered? Autosoma? I don't think mitochondria I mean, how many mitochondrial genes do you know? Or how many mitochondrial genes actually exist in mitochondria? It's like 15 actual proteins, ribosome, a couple of DRNAs. So there's not many <laughs> diseases you can get from mitochondria. But autosoma, that can probably change a lot. Uh, let's see. So here we have 15,203. So about 200 entries change in a year. That's tiny, right? But it's only human, so no surprises there. Ah, oh, yes. So this is uh, being who we are and knowing what we are looking in the annotation, curation, and validation. 
there's a specific type of information that OMIN has to carry about. And this is probably the most abstract, abstract part of this. We are used to think about Mendelian inheritance as simple, right? Either you have a gene, a one copy or two copies, and it's going to be dominant or it's going to be recessive. And in that table, what it's break down is the complexity of phenotypes that, for example, up to last year, the number of genes with one phenotype was 2,000 and something. But if you look at the table below, there's several sets of genes, more than four sometimes, that share the same phenotype. That is the reality of a complex system such as a human. One gene can be responsible for some phenotypes, as in classic green peas and yellow peas. But then there's other cases where several genes contribute to the same phenotype. It's not only one step in the metabolism, it could be any or it could be something else, but more than one protein can be involved in certain phenotypes. That's the complexity. That means that if you sometimes find a protein, uh, sorry, a phenotype that you thought could be only caused by one mutation, you could find out that there's actually many mutations in many different proteins that bring about those phenotypes. As far as I know, what, what Yes, what OMIM is missing, even though it speaks about genes, it doesn't deal with promoters of gene expression, as far as I know. I haven't run into one yet. I'm going I'm to skip these ones because they are not that interesting. As for the categories, as opposed to Uniprot, that has this nice list of things that we can turn on and off, the, the Uniprot either shows you all of this or not at all. If there's no information, you are not going to have these entries. <laughs> if there's enough information, this is what you're going to get. Title, phenotype gene relationship, clinical psychosis, description, management, and in a way all of these are kind of historical things. If we look at the Uniprot for those, uh, what would be interesting? I, I'm going to go for hexokinase. And just with the HK3, HK not to make things more complex. Look at the table of contents. It's really simple. When we look at the one for hemoglobin, we have tons of information. HK3, even though it has uh, a name tree with information about that, is not rich in information. Funnily enough, there's cloning and expression, for those of you that were interested in not working with a human, but with the enzyme. Some mapping about in situ, you know about in situ hybridization? Yes, just you, nobody else? So this in situ hybridization means uh, it's like the low resolution way of finding where that gene is located in the genome. And what you do, and we're going to talk about later, it synthesize the complementary strand to the DNA and add it a fluorescent molecule. You incubate the cells, and if you are lucky, it's going to bind to the place where the gene is located. So you can locate it in the chromosomes. Instead of having the black and white pictures of the chromosomes, you can get fluorescent pictures of the chromosomes. So just old fashioned technique. And it, it here, pretty much, it says that in situ hybridization with fluorescence located this gene to this chromosome. Molecular genetics, uh, and that's it. There's some reference, but this, uh, this is a pretty empty entry. It doesn't have a lot of information. If we, go, if we were to go for glucokinase, now we have more information, including an animal model. Knowing what we know, if we didn't have an animal model, now we could go into Uniprof and look up human hexokinase and get, I don't know, what animal models do you know? Maybe the one from mouse, <coughs> the one from rat, I don't know about C. elegans, maybe C. elegans only has one glucokinase and it's very distant, but we can start asking and answering these questions. Is an animal model close enough to the human so that it can model that, uh, that disease or have effects because of mutations of that? And I, I don't have this really clear because I did it ages ago, but I think this particular hexokinase, it's like 96% identical to the one from rat or from mouse. So uh, technically speaking, from the point of view of that enzyme, that would be a good animal model. Let's see what this entry says about that. 
Oh, well, we already read this, right? That you can disrupt that gene in the mouse and you can generate MODI. The, what is it? Onset. I always forget these acronyms because they are so crazy. Uh, maturity onset diabetes of the junk. Yeah, you want to you want to write an ugly acronym? There you have one. Which means, if we forgive the acronym, that just by changing the gene in the stem cells, you can generate in that mouse a model for the disease. Right? You don't care about the phenotype, it's already been described, the sequence of the gene is known. You want to know what happens to the mouse that has that disease. If you give it, I don't know, uh, tannins, caffeine, whatever you can imagine. I guess that's pretty much for the model. There's more mouse, well, mice, mice, and the allelic variants. Yes, the citations. As you have seen, uh, OMI, it's a little bit more straightforward, or rather, even if you want to call it like that, more pragmatic about the citations. Anywhere you click on the entry, you have very explicitly where that information comes from. And in fact, if you wanted to check that this is true and that this was said in this paper, click on that, go to the PubMed, and you get the information. That, that is something that probably we sh don't always appreciate, but we should. If you click on the plus, it strays you straight away to a search with those results. So it cannot be easier than that, I guess. Or maybe it could, but I cannot imagine how. If you click on the citation, sometimes it even, it even takes you not to the PubMed, but to the website of the magazine, of the journal, and if we have access, you could get the full text already. Ah, yes, as local access. Can you download this? In the case of Uniproc, we saw that some of the files were gigabytes in size. But because we are looking and dealing with less information, actually downloading, for example, a tab delimited file linking mean numbers with NCBI genes and whatnot, it's probably going to be tiny, something that you can easily do. But as we know, because this database is not as public as Unipro, there are some limitations to the licensing. And, uh, this is a technicality, but it can happen anywhere. And there's licenses that are more limiting than others. In this particular one, research and education, use of OMIP is encouraged. And single user academic, that means uh, a professor like me, for example, non-profit and governmental agencies have to register to access this without a license. Right? That they want to know who's using it so people don't abuse. And that's about it. It's pretty generous for a license. Let's see, I, I'm curious about the size of the downloads. Do I have to register? Oh no, it's here. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna scroll, I just wanted to know. Probably I will re register and I might log in and that's the reason why this works. Okay, so let's do a quick exercise. This is our parameters. These are our parameters. Homo sapiens and cycles cell anemia. At least from what I've been teaching you in biochemistry and even talking about here, cycle cell anemia should be the product of one mutation in hemoglobin beta, right? That's pretty much what, what you can find in the textbooks. Subtle difference in the conformation of hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S results in that change from these healthy, normal red blood cells into those ones. So let's... Uh, where are we? Yes, right here. 
Well, we don't need Homo sapiens here because all of these databases is Homo sapiens. So cycle anemia. And for the time being, let's just assume that we don't know the molecular basis. We are looking at, for a disease that we know exists, and that's about it. Now, because we are not using any of the logical operands, we didn't use cycle and cell and anemia, we are getting tons of results. Why? Because everything that, that this search is finding cycle, that's going to be a result. Cell, another, and anemia, another. But, for better or worse, and maybe because there's tons of information, the first results have to do directly with the phenotype, cycle cell anemia, or with the related proteins, hemoglobin beta, hemoglobin gamma, and so on. And even though the database is not very colorful, you can see this nice highlighting to tell you, okay, this kind of contains everything you asked for. This is the only case, probably because it's very well annotated, so we don't know anything about this. This would be the first thing we could click. And that's, this is what we have. Cycle cell anemia, the location of the gene linked with the phenotype, and the gene being hemoglobin beta, it's at the chromosome 11. There is this phenotype and this gene locks. We have a clinical synopsis and a thin gene graphics. This is something new from this year. Let, I'm going to click on that one. I think I could click. Ooh, line here. Look at that. So we are looking at dendrogram, but this is not ex explicitly or only for genes that we did in the universe. This is, in fact, linking a gene with phenotypes and other genes that are related to, phen to this phenotype or similar phenotypes. So I'm just showing this to emphasize that datograms are not only to compare with genes, but also to establish relationships. For example, here all of these relationships are rooted on the hemoglobin beta, but they could be rooted on more than one gene or more than one function. Several different thalassemias are associated with beta. A few are more, like in the case of malaria, this is going to be one of the cases where one gene is not the only reason for a phenotype. The, the resistance to malaria given raised by the mutations is also associated with other another host of genes. Uh, if you have seen some of these proteins before, TNF, it's a tumor necrosis factor, something that's probably involved in the reproduction of cells. Uh, this is probably a membrane protein, and this is something from, um, well, energetic metabolism. So even if you still don't know anything about cycle cell anemia, you can start looking at this and realize that it's not as simple as it seems. It's not only a mutation of hemoglobin, but there's gonna be other things that make, make the disease worse or ameliorate the effects. We don't know, right? But we can discover it. We already click on the clinical synopsis and we have several traits, several, uh, let's call them clinical diagnosis. This is what if any of you go to a clinic to be diagnosed for, the uh, doctor is not going to look this up, but this is going to say, oh, that sounds totally like anemia to begin with. Is it cycle cell anemia? Other things will have to be tested, but this is probably the first diagnosis. <coughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, click on that one. <laughs> and we are going for the colorful first. Okay. So this here, you're always going to have the summaries, the quick list of information. What, this is the part of exploration, what else would you like to read about in this summary? Because my favorites are usually the animal model and the population genetics when available, or the molecular genetics. Which one do you fancy? Felicia? Molecular genetics? Molecular genetics? Ah, that's going to be boring, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see, molecular genetics, the most common cause of cycle cell anemia, notice, not the only cause, the most common. 
hemoglobin S. With hemoglobin SS disease being the most prevalent in Africa. Uh, 2010 has listed phenotypes that have been reported to cause cell cycle disease. So in a way, if I was posturing the myth that only the mutation of hemoglobin causes cell cycle anemia, here pretty much telling us yes, a lot is caused by that, but it's not the only reason. There's notice now, because this is, even though this is Mendelian genetics, that's not everything, modifier <coughs> genes, that is what is known to modify the effect of that mutation. So, uh, Priapis, a vaso-occlusive manifestation of cycle cell anemia, affects the male. So this is the equivalent of having high pressure because the, the uh, blood vessels cannot relax. That person is going to manifest something like that. Uh, yeah, but both people with these variations on this other gene have different uh, outcomes from that for having the mutation of the cycle cell anemia. That is not the only case. There's other polymorphisms on TGF beta, BCL1. Pretty much this is what we saw summarized in the dentogram. Everything way back here. How not only not only the mutation of hemoglobin beta causes cycle cell anemia, but changes or variations of all of these genes are going to give rise to slightly different variations of the same phenotype. It would be awesome to have something like this for every animal. For now, we only have it for humans. But there is a possibility of creating more information, obtaining more. Sorry, where do yes. you click to get the tree? The dendrogram, thin gene graphics. Okay. This is the graphical interface to that. But it's exact. Well, not exactly, but it's the information in molecular genetics. So in a way, you could construct it yourself. And there's websites that are devoted to constructing dendrograms for any information you have. One interesting from humans is the population genetics. And if I manage to click this one, this one is going to be full of information from different regions of the world. And queer, queer, here is where you can even find information not only in terms of geography, but also migrations. You can even, even without knowing what or when a migration occurred, sometimes you can find through the detection of these phenotypes in a population when the migrations or when the populations of migrants have changed throughout time and how they have, uh, well, moved around in the world. Not every single case of cycle cell anemia is sub-Saharan, right? That's what the books kind of convince you, that it's only in Africa. But through migrations and many other things, you can find it anywhere in the world. Uh, with different frequencies, and this is what you will find in population genetics. What about this? Is something could be controversial, so forgive me if you disagree with me, and if you want to discuss it, I'm more willing to do it. This is the most accurate description of treatment. Many genetic mutations, many diseases caused by mutations, are never cured, they are managed. This is the reality of modern medicine. How would you imagine that a disease like this one can be managed? Well, let's find out. I don't know either. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Here it is. Recent references, six years ago, this, camera, this guy summarized evidence-based recommendation for the management of cycle size disease based on another review by an expert panel of 34 years of published studies. So not every disease is going to be like that, but this is one case. If we click over here, what do you think we find out? All of the references used. So we can always make our own diagnosis, if you will. Uh, there's a review of agents to increase fetal hemoglobin production and the therapeutic use of such agents such as hydrocarbamide, the citabine butyrate in children with cycle cell anemia. So that management means, in a way, consuming those drugs, being supplemented with some of these molecules. Stimulating fetal hemoglobin by increasing gamma globin synthesis in patients with cycle cell anemia. Uh, 
Oops, sorry. Hydroxyurea therapy can ameliorate the clinical curse in adults with three or more uh, crises per year. Given that this is clinical management, it means this treatment is decided based on triage. If that person that has cycle cell anemia is more or less okay, no, no hydroxyurea. But if they are per, uh, having these seizures or crises, they are put on that. Notice they are not making, I mean, the website is not making any claims that that is the established treatment, just that it has been reported, it has been tested, right? No ethical decisions are made by you, by the website. Uh, well, here you can see plenty of these management techniques or methods or decisions. Don't take it as what should be done, just what has been done and it's reported. In general, as far as I have seen in OMIM, no clinical trials are reported, only actual trials in the wild, not new drugs, nothing like that, just something that has already been tested in the wild. Because this is uh, a long known disease, you can see that the list for the management, it's quite significant, it's pretty long, until we reach, uh, oh sorry, no, the pathogenesis. There's even gene therapy that has been tried. I, as far as I remember, that hasn't been really that successful, but you know, this is the field where you will try it. Any cell that is created in the bone marrow is susceptible to be modified genetically and to replicate in the body. This wouldn't be possible in a neuron, wouldn't be possible in muscle, pretty much all, any other tissue that is not white blood cells or red blood cells, this will be kind of impossible. Yeah, you, you know that, right? I'm not saying something new. Yeah, does everybody have that clear? Why these cells and the white blood cells could be subject to man genetic manipulation? <coughs> yes, you sure? If you don't know, this is the moment to ask. Because they're not yet differentiated? Because they are being produced throughout your life. We don't stop producing red blood cells, love us and white blood cells, they are always being produced and that is because in the bone marrow they, there's a reservoir of stem cells that can be differentiated into those so if you manage to modify the stem cells you can get unstable population of modified cells but pretty much no other tissue in the body does that uh, let's see What? Why? Right. I, I, the colors are more beautiful. <laughs> but the information is totally different. Ah, sí. We wouldn't have obtained that information from looking at this. Uh, I'll say that it's a more molecularly oriented description, whereas this is more, OMIM is more clinical oriented. And I would like to say that it's been moving from a how would we call it, like a single case mm -hmm. to more human population. And that makes it totally different than, than only, only, only product, pretty much any other. Uh, wait. Oh, yes, so this was an illustration of why hemoglobin S changes the shape of the red blood cells. And this was the result from a year ago. Uh, this is 14.19.00. I just want to check that it hasn't changed. Oh, okay, no, we got, I got into a different result. <coughs> okay, so I cannot compare. Well, sorry about that. Uh -huh. The external links. Even if you like Uniprod all the more, this site is very useful because we have all of these links or external links over here. For example, if you, oh, if you manage to get here because you were looking for the sequence, uh, sorry, for the phenotype, you can still go back to Uniprot. Mm -hmm. 
So let's say you didn't know anything about Uniprot, you didn't have a test about how to use Uniprot, and you got to the cycle cell anemia site in OMI, you can just go to the external databases, and if you click here, we should be sent to exactly the same result for humans. Only humans. But we will get there. What about the other clinical resources? Look at this. This is actually going to tell you to clinical trials where they are trying to design new therapies to ameliorate the effects. There's genetics come reference, newborn screening. As far as I remember, this type of psychosal anemia is not screened in every country in the world, except in the ones where it's the most frequent. And it's just a good reference to know about that. There's, uh, because there's animal models, we can go into the MGI mouse phenotype database. We can go into the NCBI homology. That NCBI homology is a specific website to identify homologs of your gene of interest in animal models. Not in every single little <coughs> thing in the world, just in animal models. Okay. And finally, cell lines, because the molecular basis is known, you can even look up for cells that you can actually purchase or have shipped to your, to your institution and to culture as a way to study this disease. So all of this is totally different from Expasi and from Uniprot, all in a nutshell. I'm going to uh, go to the phenotype over here. Now, uh, so what I want to do is get to the protein oh, right here. Yes. Because the protein and the phenotype are not equivalent, if I click on the protein, I'm going to get a... Uh, did you see when I click? Just, I'm going to go back just in case. Okay, cycle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. Here in the description, it says the, no, the ampersand, or sorry, the number sign, the hashtag, is used in this entry because this disease is the result of a mutation of this protein. Okay? I already read about the disease, but I want to know about the protein because they are linked directly, I can click here on hemoglobin beta and now I'm taken to the entry for the protein. There are two entities, one is the phenotype and the other is the molecular basis. And here I can find far more information such as the genome. I can do, if I'm inclined to do so, which is sometimes kind of messy, I can go to the, any of these websites and look at the genome. That is the context of this gene in, uh, in the, the DNA. Here we could find the DNA itself, which could come from RNA. This can be the cDNA without the introns, or again, Uniprot, and other human-specific related databases, other specific gene infos for that protein. So the way that the information is displayed is gonna be dependent on what you're looking at. If you're looking at the phenotype, or if you're looking at the protein. And it allows you to explore whatever you want. For example, something that we didn't see for the enotype is the cellular pathways. What, have you ever <coughs> seen any of this? I don't remember if it's the keg or the reactant. It has another cartoon, not as cute as the one from, from Uniprof. But here it is. This is a simple representation of the context of this protein in physiology. Uh, here it is. So this simple diagram is trying to relate not only the protein and the genome and the red blood cells, but the bloodstream through different white blood cells, different uh, cells from the immune system, the red blood cell when it's colonized by the parasite, in the case of the uh, malaria disease, what changes when that red blood cell is colonized, how it will regularly activate immune response in contact with the uh, red blood cell. The parasite, which is an intracellular uh, parasite, and how it crosses barriers from the blood, sorry, from the gut to the, through the liver and to the, and to the bloodstream. So this is totally different from the one in Unipro. This is not only where in the cell, but what is happening when that disease is present. Not the best diagram, but it's fairly easy to understand once you know, once you know it's there. 
And I like it. I guess we should do more things like this in classes. What, what's the context, not in the cell, not only molecularly, but physiologically? What's going on and where things are going? <coughs> yes, and as this is the case for this uh, important protein, there's all of these phenotypes associated with mutations in that protein, and as the way we see in last class, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, the traits of inheritance are displayed here. So I hope that even if you don't like this database, you can see the usefulness of accessing it. It's not only complementary to Uniprot, but it's actually totally different from another point of view, center in the paradigm of health and disease. Do you know what? I haven't clicked on these gene graphics here, for the protein, I mean. So as you can see, because we're looking at the protein itself and not the phenotype of the malaria, uh, of the cycle cell anemia, here we have even blood groups listed as phenotypes and other bacteria, bacteremia diseases, which would be something like blood poisoning, if you will, and many other things. Cyanosis, why would you think cyanosis is here? Well, because as in the movies, when somebody tried to commit suicide by, by garage and running car, that is what happens. CO displaces oxygen in hemoglobin, hemoglobin loses the cooperativity, and you are toast. But I haven't seen this for the proteins before. Okay, let's stop here and we'll pick up from this section uh, next class. By the way, I haven't finished upgrade, uh, grading the test, but I'm uploading the grades as I go. So they will be soon online for everyone. What, you don't want the grade you thought? I thought you wanted your grade. I want it, I don't have my grade. Yet. It's going to be on today, so... And everybody's doing fine as far as I can.